whether you are visiting with us for the first time or this is your one millionth visit to First Christian Church Mount Sterling over the course of your life, we are grateful that you are here this morning to worship our great God and to celebrate all that God is doing in our lives, in this community, and throughout the world. And so we welcome you this morning. Um, I have a couple of announcements as we begin. I do want to note that today after worship, the youth will be going to Kentucky Kingdom. Fingers crossed that the weather cooperates for us. And so if you are going on that trip to Kentucky Kingdom today, then meet in the um, Welcome Center after worship, and we will depart after worship and have a great day. And again, I'm hoping the weather will cooperate for us. We'll grab lunch on the way. And so parents, send lunch money with your students. This upcoming week, we have a pastor's class opportunity on the 20th on Wednesday from 6 to 7.30. So if you have, um, if you yourself are interested in learning more about the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism, or if you're interested in learning more about theology or Christian responsibility, we invite all of you to come and join us in the chapel or on Zoom for that pastor's class. Um, to all people, and so we really do want um, it to be a class that is informational and encouraging for all in their faith. The other announcement is that Vacation Bible School is quickly approaching. We will have VBS in a couple of weeks from the 26th to the 28th, and that will be from 5.30 to 8 p.m. each night. The theme this year is Make Waves great theme um, and we are excited because we're going to be talking about how our faith can make a ripple effect in our world and so when we share our faith when we live out our faith when we show others the love of Jesus at work in each of us then our faith makes ripples and waves and makes an impact on others in their faith as well by encouraging them in faith so I hope you will send your students, um, if you have a neighborhood kid or somebody down the street or if you're in Kroger in the grocery line, I invite you to tell them about our Vacation Bible School and help us to have a great turnout for that event. I do need a few more volunteers, so if you are feeling passionate about Vacation Bible School and using your gifts for God's glory, I am still looking for a Bible Story Station leader. I'm still looking for a recreation station leader, and those um, I'm looking for individuals who want to work in the kitchen, so kitchen staff, volunteers, and also those who want to help with decorations and preparation for the event. So if you are passionate about sharing God's word through the Bible, then we invite you to serve as the Bible story leader. If you are passionate about having fun and being active, then I invite you to serve as the recreation station leader. If you love to cook and love to make fun snacks um, for kids, then I invite you to serve in the kitchen with the kitchen staff. And if you um, love decorating, then I invite you to serve um, with Brittany Follett, who's been in charge of our decorations for VBS. So make plans to serve, make plans to, to plug in, and to volunteer your, your time and your efforts um, in investing in the life of a child. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let your light shine, shine, shine For Jesus all the time, time, time Walk in the light, beautiful light of his love Let your voices praise, praise, praise Let your love for Jesus raise Walk in the light, beautiful light of his love Shine every day, let your spirit say, Jesus is the light of the world. Come to the one, glory in the sun, all the debt for sin is paid. Let your voices sing, for we know the King, Jesus is the truth and way. 
let your light shine, shine, shine for Jesus all the time, time, time. Walk in the light, beautiful light of His own. Let your voices praise, praise, praise. Let your love for Jesus raise. Walk in the light, beautiful light of His own. Shine your light. Shine, shine, shine. Heavenly light. Heavenly light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. His own. Let your light shine. Shine, shine, for Jesus all the time, time, time. Walk in the light, beautiful light of His Son. Let your voices praise, praise, praise. Let your love for Jesus raise. Walk in the light, beautiful light. Walk in the light, heavenly light. Walk in the light, beautiful light of His love. Walk in the light of His love. Amen. Let us pray together after which time we will recite the Lord's Prayer um, and the words you will find on the screen in front of you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can walk in the light of your love for each of us. We thank you this morning that we woke up with so many blessings, which we should give you thanks and praise for constantly. We thank you that you are working in our lives and each of us that you are transforming our families into more faithful followers of Jesus, that you are transforming members of this body, this church, into more faithful followers, and we're grateful that you are at work in our great, big, beautiful world. We ask that you would meet us in this hour of worship today, that as we set aside all of the busyness in our minds and in our hearts, that we would be mindful of you, that we would focus on you and that we would celebrate your word, and we would celebrate the truths that are we hear in your scriptures today and in song, and that we would celebrate this meal of grace, Christ's body, Christ's blood. We ask that your hand would be all over this service today as we begin a new series called Strangest Things, which is all about how people who are not okay in the scriptures, they didn't have to stay not okay. They were able to be redeemed and set free and were able to receive abundant life because of your son Jesus. And so we ask your blessing over this service today as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture, I almost forgot. Today's scripture reading is from Genesis 12. Verses 10 through 20. Listen in to what the Spirit of God has to say. This is about Abram in Egypt. And again, this morning we begin a new series today, which I'm sure Pastor Scott will share lots more about. Now, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine, it was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. And when the Egyptians, when they see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. So say that you are my sister. 
so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life, that it will be spared because of you. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, well, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, saying, What have you done to me? He said. Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, She is my sister, so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her. Go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything that he had. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. There we go. Would the children come down, please? Run down. That's great. Couldn't charge admission last week and have smaller numbers now. But I'm glad you all are here. Strength in small numbers. All right, I got a tough question. Has anybody ever promised you that they would do something and then they didn't do it? Okay, all right, we're not <laughs> we're not we're not going to take names or anything. We just uh, uh, did it. Uh, you just don't say their name, okay? Okay, so one time we pink me and my sister Pinky promised that she was going to sleep with me one night. And then she and, and she didn't sleep with me that night that I pink that we that we pinky promised. Did did you get a good night's sleep anyway? Okay. All right. My brother said he was going to play with me, but uh, after we came home, but when he came home, but when we came home, he let um he um he told he lied to me. You do realize that when I said no names, that when <laughs> <laughs> when you when y'all say brother and sister, I think it's kind of letting the cat out of the bag anyway. But uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing. Is everything better at home now? Everything okay? Okay, all right. Moms are like that, okay? Well, we really got a feedback on that one. <laughs> so people have promised you, and, and you remember when somebody promises you something and then they break it, right, or they don't follow up? Okay. <laughs> Family members. So it didn't make you feel very good, did it? Kind of hurt your feelings a little bit? No. Oh, man. Yeah. Just one time? So, so I cried, my, so I cried myself to sleep one night. And then I'm, and then I woke up with a good night, with, and then I said, 
Why did I cry myself to sleep last night? Isn't that great, though, that you forgot even the reason you were crying? All right. Jumbo, what did you say? Just a second ago, you said something. I didn't want to not, not allow you to say anything. Usually, no one lies to me. That's great. That's great. Just don't live in yesterday or no city. Okay. All right. Well, you'll get around to that. I was going to ask you who the guest was that you brought to church last week, but it was your pop because he was all clean shaven and nobody, nobody recognized him. All right. I said, who's that with John? Now, okay, let me ask you something even tougher. Have you ever promised somebody something and then follow through with it? Oh, there you do. <laughs> you don't have to talk about it or anything like that, okay? But thank you for being brave and admitting that. Well, I I got a confession to make too. I uh, I promised a guy that I'd do something for him one time, and this was way back in college. So this was uh, years ago, and um, I told the guy that I'd help him work, and then I didn't show up. And that was so long ago, but I still remember it because not that he was mad at me as much as he was disappointed that I didn't show up, okay, after I said I would. Now, Pastor Scott, in just a little while, is going to talk about Abraham and Sarah. And God made a lot of prom promises to Abraham. He called them covenants, all right? And he and Sarah didn't do a very good job of listening to God at times, okay? They just went ahead and... Uh, no, that was a little bit after that, just a couple of years, okay? But um, they got impatient and decided they were going to do things on their own, and when you get impatient and don't want to wait on God, what happens? Something bad happen? Most of the time? Yeah. Yep. I guarantee you. So... Well... Yeah, he got it. Yeah, he did get impatient. He just flat out disobeyed God, didn't he? We're getting off on a tangent here, though. I was um, that when I was um, patient. Okay, I wanted mac and cheese one day, and so my mom was supposed to make it for me. It's like one of those easy packs, and so I got impatient and. Accidentally made it wrong, but it still but it still tastes good. All right, there you go, folks. This is a little floor show, I guess. So um, um, I'll tell you what. Let's just remember that promises are important, especially a promise from God, because He'll always come through. But do your best whenever you promise somebody to come through and do what they're expecting. Okay. All right, let's have a prayer. God, thank you. Thank you for inquisitive minds. Thank you for fun. Thank you for laughter. Thank you that we can share in everything that you give us and all the blessings that we have on this day. In your name, Jesus, amen. Storms of 
Aren't you glad sermons don't happen like uh, Elder Kirk's children's message? Any of y'all want to come forward and talk about someone that you got something against? We just had a Seinfeld Festivus right here in First Christian Church. We do have a, a sermon to be preached. I first just want to say apologies to those who are normally online. This service will be delayed we're recording instead of live streaming because we have an internet issue that happened uh, today those things happen if you have internet at home you know happens but uh, I think Cody might want to raise is what's going on here Cody's away today he usually takes care of things and the gremlins got us on a day uh, when Cody's away so do want to apologize to those we will put it up on delay recording here in a minute but I am excited. I'm excited that you're here. If you're visiting with us today, thank you for being here. I'm excited to start a new series. This series is called Strangest Things. The next series is not going to be called Strangest Things. It's going to be called Smoother Things, because when you start a series called Strangest Things, strange things happen. But I did want to work on a series because the next series, Stranger Things, is so popular in our culture right now. The Duffer Brothers tapped into what many people who grew up in and around the 80s knew, and that's that there was some pretty good cinema and literature back during the 80s. The Duffer Brothers tapped into some of the horror books written by Stephen King and some of the movies directed by Steven Spielberg, and they created this paranormal, supernatural series called Stranger Things that people today are just enamored with, and I don't want people to be so enamored with Netflix that they forget about the Bible, because there are some pretty strange things that go down in the Bible. In fact, over the next six weeks, we're going to talk about the strangest things that you could imagine coming out of the Bible. Today, we're going to talk about Abram and Sarai. Now, you know them better as Abraham and Sarah, because God later changes their names. That's what God does in the scriptures. Do you remember Jesus changed Peter's name? He called him the rock. Simon, Peter, you are the rock, and I will build my church on you. God has a history of that. So I'm going to refer to them as Abram and Sarai. I might slip and call them Abraham and Sarah. You know who they are. 
And if you don't, I'm going to introduce them to you. This couple is the first of the patriarchs and matriarchs. They are the first family in the Bible. When you, when you hear in the Old Testament them refer to the forefathers and foremothers, they don't start astonishingly with Adam and Eve. They say the, the son of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because these people were so important, Abraham and Sarah, Abram and Sarah. In fact, God makes promises to Abraham. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about standing on the promises of God. And we know that not only for Christians, we draw our genealogy all the way back to Abraham. He, through Abraham, God blessed the entire world. Not only Christians, but Jews, of course, first. Abraham was father of the Jewish religion. And then, of course, the Christian religion, but also Muslims draw their faith story from Abraham. They take it a different route through Hagar and Ishmael. But nonetheless, this is why the big three religions in the world, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, are called Abrahamic faiths. That is, that we all come from common ancestors. Now, maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. But I bet you, you didn't know the story, or if you did, you read across it. I bet you didn't know the story of Abraham pimping out his wife, Sarah. I bet you didn't know that. It happens. Did you hear Pastor Michelle read it? Yeah, it happened. It's an incredible story. It's a strange story. Who would think this sounds like Hollywood stuff here? Who would think that something like this would be in the Bible? But it's right here. And here's what's stranger about it. We know Abraham because he was the forerunner of faithfulness, right? Paul in Romans points to Abraham as the forerunner of the faith. He's so faithful. This story happens right after he gets a promise from God. Chapter 12. If you read back to the beginning of chapter 12, I want you to look at that with me. The beginning of chapter 12, it says... God spoke to Abraham saying, Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I shall show you. This is the land we call the promised land. And God says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people, Christians, Jews, Muslims, all of the people, will be blessed through you. And then just seven verses later, and I know this is going to hurt your ears because we're Christians. We don't like thinking this way. Just seven verses later, we see Abraham, Abram, pimping out his wife. Isn't that strange? Well, let's look at how it happens. Let's see what we can learn from it. The story starts out, and I'm going to paraphrase it all. I'm not even going to look at it because I'm going to tell you what it is in a paraphrase. The story starts out that there was a famine in the land, so they went down to Egypt. That's a familiar narrative. Do you remember Jacob and his family? Do you remember? After Joseph was traded into slavery and he ends up in Egypt there was a great famine in the land and Joseph or Jacob son of Isaac son of Abram they end up in Egypt because of a famine here's what happened this is a dry arid region and they started having this famine maybe it was a drought we can understand drought and the drought drove them from their homeland in Canaan down into Egypt to where we know Egypt is a very fertile place and they were looking for food. They were looking to survive. So the story starts out very familiar. But along the way, Abram says to Sarai, you know what? You're pretty good looking. And you know what's going to happen when you get around these foreigners? And we are not. We're, we're, we're immigrants. You know what's going to happen? When we get to that strange land, they're going to look at you because you're beautiful, and they're going to kill me. And they're going to take you from me. 
Now, you don't want that. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to pretend to be my sister. And what's going to happen is you're just going to have to go on into Pharaoh's house. I know, I know, you don't want to do that, but this has got to happen. Otherwise, I'm going to die. Do you see what's going to happen? They, they will kill me. You don't want your husband to die, do you? So go into his house, pretend to be my sister, and guess what? He will bless me because they have to pay a dowry. If he takes you as his wife, I'll get paid. You see, this story is based on suppositions that were ancient, and we know about them. If a woman in the ancient world was to be wed to another man, that man, the husband, was to pay a dowry price to the family. And since there wasn't a father in this story, Abraham would get paid as the brother. That supposition was based on the tradition of the ancient world. Now, also there's a supposition going on that you have to be aware of, that if a woman is beautiful and she's found to be in a strange land or even amongst her own people, that... Maybe a king would kill for a woman. Now, we know this happened, don't we? Do you remember the story of Esther? She could have been taken by force into the king's house. Do you remember the story of David and Bathsheba? Huh? There's a story of a king who kills a husband to have a queen. So we know this is happening, and this is the supposition that this whole story is moving on. And so what happens is, is that Sarai pretends she uses a ruse. She pretends because her husband asked her to, because his neck was on the line, she pretends to be Abram's sister. And then she's married off. Now you might be thinking about chapter 20 because this story comes up twice in Genesis. Now here's what's happening. Either Abraham's a pimp that pimps out his wife many times because it happens again in chapter 20, or chapter 20 retells the same story over and over again. And what happens when you retell the story is you try to tell it a little differently. But I'm not going to use that. What I'm going to say to you is, is that most people want to say, well, two things are happening here. Sarai was really Abram's half-sister. Oh, I saw it. Yeah, that's pretty strange, huh? Both Abram and Sarai had the same father, Terah. So she was literally, I know, I know it's strange. She was literally Abram's half-sister. So they're not technically lying, all right? And what we typically do, preachers, when they preach on this, is say, well, you know, in chapter 20, when Abimelech took Sarai into his house, he said, no, I will not go into the bedding room with her. Rather, I know this, this woman is married to this man. So Abimelech in chapter 20 gives her back and says, I didn't even touch her. But listen what happens in this chapter. Far more scandalous. The Pharaoh says to Abram, why did you allow me to take her as my wife? Now, the Hebrew is very specific. We kind of pass over that word, take her. But if you're watching some Netflix streaming, you're going to figure out what take her means. She was literally Pharaoh's wife. Whew. And then what happens? A plague comes to Egypt. Do you see a foreshadowing of the Exodus narrative and the Moses story here? A plague afflicts the house of Pharaoh. To the point, he says, get out of here. Actually, what he says is, what have you done to me? He starts getting plagued. So he sends Sarai back to Abram, and then he sends them away with all their goods back to the promised land. Now, this story, as strange as it may be, and it is strange, did you... Let me see by a show of hands how many of you actually read this story before. Let me see it. That's pretty good. Did you dwell on it very much or did you just pass on over to the point where God starts blessing Abraham again and Sarah and then you get to this story of, of her having Isaac? Do you kind of skim over this one? Let me tell you, don't skim over this one because this story is a foundational narrative for human culture. Do you know that Homer knew this story when he wrote the Iliad? 
Do you know Homer's Iliad, that Greek mythological story about the Trojan War that was started because a prince named Paris wanted a wife named Helen and stole her from her husband? Do you know that story about the Trojan horse and all the destruction that happened? This movement from destruction to drama to deliverance is the foundational narrative of human existence. I'm watching a show right now on Hulu. It's called The Old Man. It's based on this. If you're not watching it, you may check it out, but let me tell you, it's about a man, Jeff Bridges. Not the dude Jeff Bridges. This guy is CIA Jeff Bridges. And Jeff Bridges takes a king's wife and flees the CIA, leaves the CIA. You're not allowed doing that. Leaves the CIA, leaves Afghanistan where he stole the king's wife, and the entire story is a drama unfolding about this upset king who wants to get back at the old man. Well, at least that's what I think it's all about. That's from this year, so I'm still trying to keep up with it. But let, do you see that this story of destruction, drama, deliverance is at the foundation of what stories that really make us tick? Stranger Things, that's the way it happens, right? There's this whole parallel universe where it's touching. It's called Upside Down, and it's touching the earth, and things are happening, supernatural things. Do you see some supernatural things happening here? Sarai is in Pharaoh's house, and all of a sudden, he's getting plagued. Wow. There are a lot of similarities. Let me show you another thing that you probably did not know. This is for you Bible scholars out there. Let me show you something that you didn't know. If you back up in Genesis 12, you'll see that Abram builds an altar to God between a place called Ai and Bethel. Bethel, if you're from this part of the country, we call it Bethel. You know what? You probably know what Bethel means, right? Especially if you're from Bethel. It means house of God. Okay, so he builds an altar between Bethel, house of God, and I. Do you know what I means? In the Hebrew, I is the location of the destruction that Joshua wrought to the Canaanites. In Hebrew, the word I means destruction. Can you see that Abraham encounters God in the place between destruction and deliverance? Didn't know that, did you? And so he builds an altar there. Literally, Abram builds an altar between destruction and deliverance. Can you see that's the foundational story for us too? We encounter God somewhere between destruction and deliverance, thanks be to God. We encounter him when we are sometimes at our worst, not our best. Usually when we're at our best, we flee God, but somewhere between destruction and deliverance, there abides the Holy One. Man, I love that. I love finding that stuff in the scriptures. Let me tell you what this story is all about. Let me boil it down for you. This story is about relationships. And here's the first thing I'm going to say. I mean, we got to be asking ourselves, what can we learn from a story of a man who gives his wife to another man to save his own neck? Here's what you can learn. It's about relationships. And I want you to write this down. Deception leads to destruction. Deception leads to destruction. Lies catch up to you. They do. And lies not only catch up to you, but they catch up a whole lot of other people in lies. Proverbs 19, we just studied it. Man, how good is God? We just literally studied this this week. Proverbs 19 says twice, Nobody who bears false witness goes unpunished. Any of y'all ever told a lie and just felt chained up to it? Now, you don't have to admit that here. I'm not doing the children's message. But have any of you ever told a lie and you just felt like you were shackled by the lie that you told? Proverbs 19 not only says nobody goes unpunished who lies, but it says it again to repeat how important it is. Nobody who bears false witness goes unpunished. Let me tell you this about relationships. 
No healthy relationship can be built on lies. Can't. Can't do it. Doesn't matter if I'm talking about a marital relationship, a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, a friendship, a Christian relationship, a brotherhood, a sisterhood. Those relationships cannot be built on lies. Abram, Abram and Sarai both lie to Pharaoh, and it causes destruction. They're somewhere between destruction and deliverance, and their lies are the reason for it. I want you to think about the destruction that must have happened between Abram and Sarai. Think about it. Can you imagine giving your wife into the possession of another man? Let me stop right there. If there are any young men in the room, women are not men's possession. You may read that in the Bible that, that women are bartered for like cattle, but I need to say it clearly because there are places in this community and in this county and in this world where they talk about women as if they're just property. That's not the case. Women are not property. They're created in the image of God, Genesis 1, just like we are. In the image of God, he created them. I want you to think about the destruction that that lie must have caused to Abram and Sarah, pimping out his own wife. I watched a, a movie. It's been a long time ago. Some of you all are too young to even remember it. It was called Indecent Proposal. You remember? I know. I watch some stuff you don't think preachers watch. i got to watch it because you all are watching it. But it was called Indecent Proposal, and there was a, Robert Redford was in it, Demi Moore, and Woody Harrelson. Thank goodness I remembered all of them. But what happens is, is Robert Redford, I mean, some of you all, Robert Redford, hubba hubba, right? He says he's going to pay a price to have one night with Demi Moore. Some of you fellas now going hubba hubba. If Woody Harrelson will just give him over to her for one night. You remember that movie? If you watched it, man, Woody struggled. Gosh, can you imagine the thoughts that must have been going through Abram's mind? He knows what he's done. He knows, you know, Queen Esther, we know. She had to get all that perfume on. That wasn't for nothing to go up, right? So Abram's thinking about it. I want you to think about the destruction that happens between Sarai and Abram. Is it any wonder that later in their story, she goes ahead and says, I'm going to go ahead and give Hagar over to you. Is it any wonder that this happens now? Well, you gave me over to someone. I might as well give you over to someone. Is it any wonder that all this stuff starts to happen after this one story? Listen, I know that Genesis 20 wants to clean it up, and most Christian preachers want to clean it up, and most Christians, when they read this, they just want to skip it. But this is a foundational story in the Bible because let me tell you that deception leads to destruction. I know they didn't technically lie. Sarai was Abram's half-sister. They didn't technically lie, but let me tell you this. You pay half your taxes. See how that works out for you. You get pulled over by an officer after you've had a few drinks and you tell him you're only half drunk. See how that works out for you. My grandmother told me a half-truth is still a whole lie, and that's the bottom line. Deception leads to destruction, lies, catch up to you so you need to build your relationships on truth and honesty and that's what leads to blessing now you might be sitting there thinking to yourself well, wait a minute wait a minute Abram and Sarai they were blessed by this they left Egypt with cattle sheep donkeys Male and female slaves. Did you read that part? Did you hear it? That was the last of it. Pastor Michelle read it. Let me give you a little spoiler alert. Do you know who was numbered among those female slaves? None other than the Arab, Hagar. Whoo! I like when, you see... It's like Netflix, man. When the Bible gives you a curveball, see, they left. 
Oh, they're out of here, man. Sheep, cattle, donkeys were rich. That means rich. But they also took Hagar. And we know what happens with Hagar. Hagar becomes the concubine of Abram. And after she's the concubine, when Sarai can't get pregnant, she's having issues getting pregnant, she gives Hagar to Abram. And that causes a whole lot of destruction. Let me tell you this. Doubt leads to destruction. And I'm not just talking any kind of doubt here. I'm talking doubting God leads to destruction. Listen to me. I want you to look at your Bibles. This isn't me telling you. This is the Bible witnessing to it. Can you see that just in seven verses, I'm not talking seven chapters. I'm not talking seven books. I'm talking in seven verses after Abram was blessed, he gets in a little pickle, and what's he do? He goes with his own plan. Now, I would think if I had an encounter with God, and they're very few, let me tell you. Some of us have them, others don't. But when you have an encounter with God, it is life-changing, life-altering. And in seven verses, this means really quick. Abram just had this encounter with God, and all of a sudden they got to go to Egypt. And what's he start thinking? Oh, my goodness, what's going to come of me? What is going to become of me? I'm, I got a beautiful wife. They're going to kill me. Wait a minute. Did he not remember that God said, I will bless you, that I will keep you, that I will make a great nation of you? Now listen, they didn't have any children at this point. Why wouldn't have Abram been thinking about that blessing? But he's not. All he's doing is doubting. Can you see that doubt leads to destruction? I'm going to refer back to Proverbs 19 because I believe this is the sovereignty of God that we studied this, this proverb on Wednesday night Bible study. Proverbs 19 says this, People make plans, but God's purpose prevails. God's got a purpose. We make plans. We'll come up with a way to try to get ourselves out of a pickle, but God has purpose, and purpose prevails. This Abram, who Paul calls an exemplar of the faith, this Abram, who is the first of our forefathers of the faith, this Abraham, who just had a promise given to him, doesn't say, I will trust in God. He says, no, come here, wife, we're going to come up with this plan. Because humans have plans, but God has purpose. And I want you to think just for a minute. I want you to think about what this did to Abram's relationship with God. You see, God makes a covenant with Abraham, Abram, and Abram immediately doubts God. Is that strange to you? Here's some good news. Here's some good news. We all fall short of the glory of God. Even Abram, the forerunner, the first faithful one, falls short of the glory of God. Abram's not okay. So if you doubt, and if you fall short of the glory of God, that means you're not okay. But God can still bring deliverance from that. And God will still, because God has purpose when humans make plans. And it would almost appear that Abram got away with doubting God until you realize what I pointed out to you. It would, almost, it would almost appear that Abraham got away with it until you realize that Hagar was in that caravan heading on back up to the promised land and it was going to cause a lot of problems for Abram's seed. In fact, is it any surprise to you then that later God makes a promise to Hagar who got caught up in all this destruction. He makes a promise to, to her and says, I will make a great nation of you also. Read it. It's there. I want you to think about how doubt can lead to destruction. Sure, you need to make plans. I'm not saying you don't need to make plans. But when something happens to your plan, God's got purpose for you. God's got purpose. And here's the last thing I want to say. And this is the one to put a circle around when you write it down. God is the only true hero of the Bible. That's it. We can, there, are, there are forefathers. God is the only true hero of the Bible. There are some strange things that happen in these scriptures. Over the next five weeks, we're going to look at them and you're going to say, wow, can't believe he preached on that. 
Wow, didn't know that was in there. There are some strange things that go down in the Bible. But God is the only hero. Abram and Sarai, they're not okay. And you know what? Being not okay is okay. But it's not okay to stay not okay. If you're not okay, that's okay. Just know that God has made a promise to you through Jesus Christ that I will be with you even until the end of time. That's a promise. In between destruction and deliverance, that's where we always find the promises of God. Those are worth standing on. You guys sang it. It was beautiful. I need you to stand in those promises. Maybe you've had something going on in your life where your relationship is struggling. I want you to remember the promises of God. I want you to remember that God will stay with you. God will hang in there with you. That God can turn your mess into a message. That God can turn your troubles into triumph. Maybe you're going through something physically. I want you to remember that God is a healer. How many of y'all have experienced God's healing in your life? Maybe you're going through something, you're in need of healing. I want you to remember, maybe it hasn't happened to you yet, but God's still a healer. How many of you know God is a mighty counselor? How many of y'all are going through something right now and you feel alone, completely lonesome? God's still a counselor. You can talk to him. You can confess. Gosh, the children did a great job of confessing, didn't they? Jesus said we should be like little children. Wouldn't it be awesome to be like a little child sitting here and saying, no one's lied to me? Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be awesome to ha even have something go down with your sibling and you still love her? Still cry yourself to sleep because you're not close to her. God's a mighty counselor. Maybe you've had something go down between you and God. Maybe you've broken a promise to God. Abram did it. He didn't trust in that moment what God said seven verses earlier were true. He came up with his own plan. But you know what? God still blessed him, and God changed his name. And let me tell you this morning, maybe you are not a Christian today. Maybe you have never claimed Jesus as your Lord. He's going to change your name. Maybe you're sitting there just guilt-ridden. Maybe you're sitting there feeling that you're not worthy. Jesus Christ is going to change your name to Beloved redeemed, forgiven child. If you haven't done that, this is the opportunity. You can claim Jesus as Lord. We will baptize you. Maybe you've already done that and you just want to recommit your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you come forward today? Whatever the reason, the Spirit is leading you to come. Would you come now as we continue in worship? this 
God, you are the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You raised Jesus up from the grave, from death, and delivered him as the forerunner of all eternity, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not die, but live forever and ever. God, we thank you for that supernatural act. If we can give that to you, God, resurrection of our Christ we can give that to you we can give you the other little destructions that seem really really big in our lives God we know that you have the power to make a way where there's no way and so I call upon you today Father to speak to the hearts of those who are here who needed to, to hear that word and know God that strange things happen in our lives the strangest things happen in the Bible and yet you still delivered Abram and Sarai and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and so on unto each of us who you now call beloved, forgiven, healed. God, let somebody stand in that promise because that's the only promise that matters, God. We can make promises to each other, but the ones that really matter are your word, God breathed, that we can stand on and have faith that those words are true. God, we love you, and we ask for your forgiveness where we have wronged others. God, we, we do some strange things. I mean, the story of Abram and Sarah teaches us that we are sometimes our own worst enemies. God, we doubt you. We just got to confess that. We doubt you. We don't doubt you exactly in word, but we doubt you in our actions. We just ask you to help us stand in your purposes and not our plan. God, I know there's someone out there, they're struggling in their relationship.